In the previous phase of our effort to catalog and present findings on the flood parasite, we discussed what is arguably the most important building block, the flood supercell. Before our time was cut short, we observed the multiple forms which the flood can take in bonding with its host, in both disturbing and wondrous ways. Now we will discuss the next phase of flood evolution, offensive measures. By the time a population realizes the threat the flood represents, it is often already too late. Even still, no species peacefully accepts complete annihilation. Spores and pod infectors alone, although overwhelming in number, aren't sufficient to overcome an effective defense. As a result, the flood is once again forced to adapt. The hosts previously infected by pods or spores are warped into combat forms as they are commonly known, biological killing machines bent on the destruction and assimilation of the species to which their host once belonged. Once infection has taken place, the flood supercell consumes and converts sections of the host body, creating growths and appendages composed of new supercells. In sapient hosts, certain limbs and sensory organs are preserved for operating tools, equipment, weapons, vehicles, and ships. In fact, infection forms often augment the host's body, optimizing it as a living weapon. Once again, the flood supercell demonstrates remarkable adaptability, arranging itself to mimic any organ necessary for the host's continued functioning. Disturbingly, even after the flood supercell assumes control of the host, the governing infection form can often still be observed embedded within the victim, its red sensory appendages protruding from flesh like blind eyes. Examples of combat forms are many and highly varied, and are not limited to any one particular species. Humans, Sangili, Giralinae, and Ungoi have all been observed in this highly aggressive combat state, each exhibiting some form of extreme morphological alteration, often with derived appendages designed specifically for melee combat. As previously discussed, the infection process is almost universally fatal to the host, and, as the binomial of the flood species indicates, most combat forms are little more than walking corpses, but there are exceptions. A notable case is that of Wallace Jenkins, who was an infantryman in the UNSC Marine Corps. As part of a series of skirmishes with the Covenant, a hostile hegemony of multiple alien species, Jenkins was part of a combat team led to explore a facility thought to hold a strategic weapons cache. In reality, this structure was a chamber designed to contain the flood. As the team entered the facility, they were ambushed, and in the chaos, Jenkins was hit, not by a bullet, but by the cruel, probing tentacles of a pod infector. He was not the only member of his team to be infected, but his case was unique. While the other infected members of the team, with the exception of their commanding officer, died immediately, Jenkins did not. In fact, Private Wallace Jenkins maintained his faculties, fully aware of the infection setting upon him, the pain of his contorting body as limb and tissue were forcibly rearranged, and of the actions his body made he could not control. At the time, it was theorized that Jenkins' infection form, weakened from centuries of containment, simply could not fully control him. Indeed, before his eventual death, Jenkins was even able to reassert control of his body for a brief period of time, overcoming the neurological rewiring that had taken place and issuing a warning to the crew of a ship that would have brought the flood infection to Earth. But why exactly was this particular pod infector unable to fully assimilate its host? While the time to study Jenkins in detail has long passed, I believe that it is a combination of several factors, each stemming from this organism's prolonged containment. First, the structural integrity of the flood supercells may have been compromised over time, which could have led to conformational changes in the FSC's molecular machinery. For instance, the altered structure of proteins responsible for neural integration such as ion channels, transporters, or synaptic vesicle machinery, may have disrupted the FSC's ability to effectively interact with its host's neurons. In some ways, we see something similar in neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, where the misfolding of proteins leads to the formation of amyloid beta plaques, which disrupt neuronal function and communication. Second, the functional efficacy of the flood supercell could have been diminished due to the weakened infection form's inability to synthesize and release the appropriate neurotransmitter neuromodulators, or other signaling molecules necessary for neural communication. A biological analogy for this functional impairment can be drawn from certain neuropsychiatric disorders, wherein an imbalance in the synthesis, release, or reuptake of neurotransmitters like serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine contributes to the pathophysiology of the disorder. In the context of the infection form that attacked Jenkins, the impaired release of signaling molecules would likely have led to suboptimal neural integration, hindering its ability to control the host's 
nervous system effectively. Finally, the infection form's capacity to form stable and functional synapses with the host's neurons might have been compromised due to alterations in synaptic plasticity. Synaptic plasticity, or the ability of synapses to strengthen or weaken over time, is crucial for the formation and maintenance of neural connections. Factors such as altered expression of synaptic proteins, dysregulation of intracellular signaling cascades, or impaired homeostatic plasticity mechanisms likely contributed to the infection form's inability to establish efficient connections with Jenkins neurons. Once again, we could draw parallels to certain learning and memory disorders, where the disruption of synaptic plasticity mechanisms impairs the formation of new memories or the consolidation of existing ones. These compromises would almost certainly result in inefficient neural integration, allowing Jenkins' consciousness to intermittently regain control over his body. Whatever the case, this kind of largely ineffective assimilation is extraordinarily rare, and so any theory as to the nature of this failure, so to speak, is little more than conjecture. For most sapient organisms, the combat form is just one stage in the flood's ever-changing infection strategy, and occasionally, multiple infected organisms congeal into even more highly specialized combat forms, such as the case for the so-called juggernaut, a seething, tentacled mass that stands some 18 feet high. But even more terrifying than their immense size and armor-piercing tentacles is what occurs just beneath their writhing flesh. In the Juggernaut, we see a spark of the Flood's more pressing goal, achieving compound intelligence. This form harnesses the minds of multiple hosts, wielding their combined knowledge to analyze enemy activity and adjust the local Flood strategy accordingly. If the Flood parasite finds itself unable to establish a hive, in the case of an unexpectedly effective resistance for example, the Juggernaut may evolve into an abomination a mobile, combat-ready, and highly specialized creature known as a key mind. In terms of the Flood's invasion strategy, it is the creation of these key minds that catalyzes a transition from feral aggression to coordinated conversion, and as the Flood grow in number, key minds combine into larger, exponentially more intelligent networks. If left unchecked, the Flood's centralized intelligence, a proto-compound intelligence, or proto-grave mind, will emerge from within this seething mass of corrupted flesh, sifting through and feeding on the memories of flood-infected victims. These entities are typically formed to manage advanced tasks, such as piloting starships. In these instances, flood forms amalgamate as many hosts possessing relevant knowledge as possible, such as former pilots and officers. By utilizing a sophisticated extracellular matrix, the flood binds and integrates these multiple host bodies. This matrix not only provides structural support, but also facilitates the transfer of neural signals and nutrients throughout the amalgamated mass. In stark contrast to the standard flood forms that obliterate a victim's consciousness, proto-grave minds interrogate their victims slowly, engaging in a poorly understood method of neural communication that borders on telepathy and permitting the host's nervous system to provide information. As previously mentioned and distinguished from other known flood forms, proto-grave minds are immobile and unresponsive in combat. They have never been observed to move autonomously, even amidst nearby combat forms. Indeed, proto-grave minds appear to exist as a collection of inert bodies, and one can even observe recently assimilated and deformed bodies embedded within its flesh. Tragically, of course, these bodies were once living people, each with their own memories, dreams, and thoughts, each of these only to be ripped from their minds forever. Such was the case for Captain Jacob Keyes, a commanding officer in the UNSC Navy and renowned tactician with more than 35 years of combat experience. It was Captain Keyes who, unaware of the facility's true purpose, led a certain combat team into a certain containment facility, the very same team to which Wallace Jenkins belonged. And like Jenkins, Keyes was infected in the Flood's ambush by a pod infector. But unlike Jenkins, for his commander, the Flood had different plans. As the pod infector's tendrils breached Key's skin and muscle tissue, it delivered its payload of flood cells and foreign genetic material into his bloodstream. Initially, as with many infected, Key's body was contorted into a combat form. However, it seems that the flood's burgeoning intelligence recognized the value presented by his mind, not only for its strategic prowess, but its knowledge of covenant technology and, crucially, the location of Earth. Within moments, the flood cells began to infiltrate Key's nervous system. Through mechanisms not fully understood, the alien cells integrated themselves into his neural pathways, forming new connections and disrupting existing ones. This integration process was marked by periods of intense pain as the flood cells aggressively rewired his neural networks and overrided his cognitive functions, steadily eroding his sense of self. While the infection progressed in Key's nervous system, the flood cells also induced significant physiological changes in his body. The alien genetic material likely acted as a catalyst for rapid 
rapid cellular mutation, causing his tissues to undergo dramatic structural alterations. In short, the Flood was creating a proto-grave mind with keys at its center. Kept alive, he perceived most, if not all, of this. And yet, somehow, Keyes summoned the willpower to attempt to safeguard crucial information from the Flood's insidious invasion, and, amazingly, he was able to do so for many agonizing hours. But the human mind can only endure so much, and like so many before him, he was eventually crushed beneath the unbearable mental onslaught. Fortunately, his efforts were not in vain, but that is, perhaps, a tale for another archivist to tell. Indeed, in almost every case and with each additional host integrated, the proto-Gravemind's intelligence and decision-making capacity grows exponentially, and this increased cognitive power enables it to better coordinate the Flood's offensive strategies. Ultimately, the accumulation of biomass is essential for the proto-Gravemind to reach the next stage of Flood evolution. The Gravemind Emerging from the grotesque fusion of countless consumed minds, the Grave Mind is a sinister tapestry of memories, knowledge, and experiences, all woven together to create a consciousness more vast and complex than any single sentient being could ever attain. It is within this vast intellect that the true horror of the Flood is revealed, for within the Grave Mind's labyrinthine thoughts, the extinguished hopes, dreams, and fears of its victims are forever entwined. This creature, known formally as Inferi Sententia, or Thinking Dead, is the Flood's supreme strategist and puppet master. It orchestrates the nightmarish symphony of the Flood's onslaught, coordinating its functions with chilling precision and ruthlessness. It directs its minions with near-complete synchronicity, turning what once appeared as a chaotic swarm of ravenous monstrosities into a relentless, organized force that is as methodical as it is terrifying. In more concrete terms, the grave mind is a centralized or compound intelligence and is believed to arise from the self-assembly of FSCs into a highly interconnected neural network. This network, which is hypothesized to involve a combination of electrical and chemical synapses, enables rapid communication between individual FSCs, allowing the Flood to respond swiftly and efficiently to environmental changes. Crucially, however, the Gravemind's influence extends beyond its intellect. Through its sophisticated and poorly understood neural network, the Gravemind can control and manipulate flood forms with terrifying precision. This ability is particularly evident in the coordination of previously discussed combat forms, which engage in complex attacks and often appear to exhibit a level of strategic planning beyond the abilities of their individual hosts. Some have likened the Flood compound intelligence to a hive mind found in certain insect colonies, but the comparison is not exactly adequate. Insect hive minds, such as those found in ant colonies, beehives, or termite colonies, operate on a decentralized system. There is no single mastermind controlling the actions of individual insects. Instead, each member of the colony reacts to simple, local stimuli, such as pheromones or environmental cues. Though these reactions can produce complex, organized behavior at the colony level, it ultimately bears little resemblance to the Flood's centralized intelligence. With the formation of a grave mind, we see a singular consciousness directing the Flood forces with intricate strategies and tactics. It is new life born out of death, a single mind drawn from countless individuals. At its core, the grave mind is a paradoxical entity, a cob amalgamation of life and death that simultaneously embodies the zenith of flood evolution and the nadir of its victims' fates. It is unlike anything found on this planet, and we can hope that it stays that way. By this point, it is likely abundantly clear that while the Flood exhibits abilities rooted firmly in biological reality, there are many aspects of its physiology that defy conventional explanation. And, as an alien organism, this is to be expected. But there is still much we can learn by comparing the Flood to parasites found here. Leucochloridium paradoxum, for example, is a parasitic flatworm that infects the eye stalks of Succinia genus snails, manipulating their behavior and physiology to complete its life cycle. Ingested from bird feces, the parasite's eggs hatch into Myricidia larvae, which develop into sporocysts, multiply, and form brood sacs in the snail's eye stalks. The snail's behavior is subsequently altered to make it more conspicuous to birds, with the pulsating brood sacs resembling caterpillars. Upon predation, the flatworm reproduces within the bird's digestive system, and the cycle begins anew. 
Another example can be found in Ribeiroia, a trematode genus that infects tadpoles and causes limb malformations in frogs. The cercarii of these species infect the tadpoles developing limb buds, causing limb abnormalities which in turn increase their susceptibility to predation. The trematodes then mature and reproduce within the definitive host, continuing the life cycle. Lastly, we could look to Hymenopamesis argyrophaga, a parasitic wasp infecting Plesiometa argyra spiders. First, the female wasp paralyzes the intended spider with venom, lays an egg on its abdomen, and attaches a thread to its spinnerets. The larva feeds on the spider's hemolymph and later injects a chemical that alters the spider's behavior, causing it to spin a unique web. The larva then kills the spider, uses the unique web as a cocoon, and pupates. One could even draw comparisons to Earth's fungi kingdom. After all, both possessing a true nucleus and other membrane-bound organelles, the cells of both organisms exhibit strong, structurally supportive walls that provide them with the ability to withstand harsh environments. Though of course the cell walls of fungi are largely composed of chitin, and while this substance can't be ruled out of the composition found in the flood supercell, its cell walls appear to be much, much more malleable. Intriguingly, fungi grow as thread-like filaments called hyphae, which form a mass called mycelium. The flood's tentacles, which can be observed sprouting from infected creatures, do somewhat resemble hyphae, serving as sensory organs and tools for spreading infection. The cordyceps fungus, for example, infects ants, influencing their mind and essentially directing them to climb to a higher perch in order to release spores. The flood similarly infects and manipulates hosts, using its hyphae-like structures to spread its infection across vast distances. But while both the flood and certain fungi can be parasitic, the flood's scale and impact on host organisms far exceeds that of any known earth-based fungus. Even observable earth-based fungal colonies, like the vast mycelial network found in the Oregon forest, possess no intelligence or consciousness. In fact, in each of these cases, whether flatworm or fungus, the flood's transformative process is far more extensive and versatile, and is not limited to any particular species or definitive host. Still, it cannot be denied that the basic methods of growth, selection, infection, and the alteration of a host's mind and body has an eerie and disturbing precedence in nature. We've seen how effective the flood is, whether as a single cell or an organized entity, at adapting to virtually any environmental condition. Indeed, the journey thus far has shed light on the flood's various strategies to assimilate and control a diverse array of host species, pushing the boundaries of what is essentially biological warfare. But the rise of a grave mind represents yet another step toward the complete domination of whatever ecosystem to which the flood has turned its infectious gaze. Once accumulated biomass reaches sufficient volume, the grave mind's influence shapes it, repurposing bone, muscle tissue, and other organic matter into specialized forms that enable the flood to execute their offensive strategies with terrifying efficiency. These entities, known simply as pure forms, have no need for a host. Indeed, they are a true, physical manifestation of the grave mind's will. As such, pure forms exhibit an extraordinary degree of biological reconfiguration. The reappropriation of bone and muscle tissue in these forms results in a significantly enhanced capacity for destruction and strategic maneuvering, and this reconfiguration bestows upon these creatures greater mobility, strength, and resilience than their infected counterparts. Three distinct types of pure forms have been identified, the stalker form, the ranged form, and the tank form. The stalker form showcases an exceptional level of agility and maneuverability achieved through the elongation and restructuring of muscle fibers and the redistribution of skeletal elements. This enables the stalker to navigate complex terrain, provide reconnaissance, and swiftly infiltrate enemy lines. When required, the stalker form can rapidly reconfigure its biological components to transform into either the ranged or tank form. Reconfiguration of muscle tissue and chitinous growths allows for the formation of a projectile launching appendage capable of launching supercell projectiles over considerable distances. Finally, the tank form epitomizes the Flood's potential for biological repurposing in the creation of a formidable close-quarters combatant. The fusion of skeletal elements and the reinforcement of muscle tissue result in a heavily armored and brutally powerful entity, capable of breaching enemy defenses and paving the way for further Flood expansion. More than nearly any other form, the tank's brute strength and resilience demonstrate the terrifying potential of the Flood's adaptive capabilities. One especially important ingredient in the Flood's creative 
cocktail is calcium, which facilitates both the restructuring of skeletal tissue and the modulation of muscle function. It appears that the flood harnesses the host's existing calcium stores or assimilates additional calcium from external sources to reinforce and reconfigure entire structures of bone. Calcium phosphate, the principal component of hydroxyapatite crystals, lends rigidity to the bones, providing the necessary strength and durability to the newly formed skeletal arrangements. The flood may also exploit calcium's role in muscle contraction, manipulating calcium signaling to enhance muscle tissue function, particularly in the case of the stalker and tank forms. Lastly, calcium ions may allow the flood to regulate cellular signaling cascades, dictating the reconfiguration of cellular components and the emergence of specialized structures. But beyond the construction of pure forms, calcium plays another role in the flood strategy, the formation of a hive. The development of flood hives involves a systematic and efficient utilization of infected hosts. Older combat forms may evolve into carrier forms, generating more infection forms to perpetuate the infection cycle. Concurrently, flood blisters and growth pods form on various surfaces, with the latter constructed from the flesh of infected life forms not converted into combat forms. Once it has acquired sufficient resources and begins production of pure forms, combat forms assume defensive roles or are converted into additional pure forms. Under the Grave Mind's guidance, the flood also adapts the environment itself to suit its needs, replacing original structures such as doors with flood biomass and sabotaging life support systems to expedite the demise of the remaining inhabitants. Upon reaching the advanced stages of hive development, the flood evolves to become predominantly self-sustaining as infection forms are now incubated within large, bubble-like growths, thereby diminishing the need for carrier forms and hosts. However, in an echo of the precursors that gave it life, the flood's inherent drive to infect and consume all life rarely permits contentment at this stage. Eventually, the flood becomes so established in a region, an ecosystem, even a planet, that it begins to turn its collective gaze toward the stars. The collection of intelligent organisms it has brought into its fleshy fold have taken it from individual, mindless agents of infection to a compound sentience. Now, as more key minds form, the central intelligence becomes so advanced that it is capable of harnessing technology left over by the precursors. Technology so advanced, its function has been lost for eons. Grave minds have, on occasion, been observed to interface with artificial intelligence, persuading it via advanced reasoning tactics to defect from its creators and join the flood in its efforts to consume. Indeed, it was precisely this threat that led to the activation of the Halo Array, a decision that annihilated all sentient life in the Milky Way. Starved for food, the flood was forced to retreat. But as we know, with a parasite as effective and resilient as in Fairy Red Avivus, the threat of invasion is never fully eliminated. Unless, perhaps, we can begin to truly understand it. Perhaps, by analyzing its biological components and attempting to bridge the gaps in our understanding, we can form a means of defense, not only for ourselves, but for races and species throughout the universe. That, my dear traveler, is my hope. I, for one, will seek to eliminate the threat of assimilation, of a fate worse than death. That is, at least, as long as my consciousness is my own. <laughs>